Our next speaker is a San Francisco-based hacker and inventor who is best known for creating the TV Be Gone remote control, which is a keychain that can turn off TVs in public spaces. He was also the co-founder of Threeware, a successful startup, and has been featured in Make magazines and other publications. His talk today will explore the ways that technology can improve life on this planet we call home. Welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Mitch Altman. Cool. Hey, everyone. So this is my real contact info. Please feel free to contact me anytime for any reason. I, I really love helping people any way that I can. I'll start my timer. Um, this talk is uh, about technology, and uh, all of us are into technology. I've been a geek uh, really all my life. I've been playing with this stuff as a little kid, and over time I got good enough to help small companies with their problems uh, doing consulting for like 15 years of my adult life. And I did a bunch of things which I thought were pretty cool, like I'm one of the people who helped develop virtual reality. We, we uh, coined the term even. Uh, the work that I did uh, led to the power glove, for instance. And um, you know, after working for a whole bunch of companies, I uh, had the dumb idea of starting my own company. And uh, I figured I could make the same stupid mistakes that all those other companies make and uh, run my own company in the ground. But surprise, it actually was successful. Um, I wrote the firmware, I usually do hardware, uh, and the person who usually does firmware, my friend, did the uh, hardware, and that was my first taste of F FPGAs. The firmware is still available on the 2019 version from Broadcom, which is kind of crazy that my 1997 firmware is still being used. But um, uh, it, the, uh, the work that I did, even though it was a lot of cool stuff, it wasn't super meaningful for me personally. Um, and I actually quit doing all of that after 15 years so that I could do something that I thought was more meaningful. And for me, that was TV Be Gone, this keychain that turns TVs off in public places. And uh, it was meaningful for me because uh, after uh, really half of the first half of my life being totally depressed, trying to escape into a television, uh, I really wanted to turn them off in public places, so I, I did and um, made it available for other people. And I've been making a living with 12 friends on this for the last 16 years, kind of amazing. Um, I've uh, now been mostly doing uh, open hardware. Oh, TV Gone's open source, of course, everything I do is. I've been doing open hardware kits so that uh, other people can learn this stuff and um, go on to do whatever they do. I also started NoiseBridge, an early hacker space in San Francisco. Uh, that can teach all sorts of different tech to people, not just what we think of like high-tech electronics, but art and craft and whatever we do at hackerspaces. Uh, how many people here have ever been to a hackerspace? Almost everybody, that's awesome. So, um, yeah, and like doing NoiseBridge, uh, start helping start NoiseBridge inadvertently uh, started a, a hackerspace movement along with the help of zillions of other people around the world, and now there's thousands uh, starting from 40 way long ago. Um, but doing TV Be Gone got me internet famous, and I got invited to give lots and lots of talks. Um, and so all over the world I've been giving talks, and whenever I give a talk, they might pay me something, and I'll just do a workshop for free for a hackerspace or people wanting to start a hackerspace. And it seemed to get the energy going, and it felt good to help people do that, so I kept doing that, and now I've been doing workshop tours all around the world. And uh, that's just sort of a background about me to give you a sense of where I'm coming from here. Um, uh, we have a long history on our planet as people, about 300,000 years, depending on how you define people. And over that amount of time, we've learned a lot. And uh, we've forgotten a lot, too. But uh, we've gained a lot of wisdom along the way. Uh, all sorts of wisdom uh, that is still really good today. But over time, a lot of it just, even if it is good wisdom, people kind of just look at the words. They don't really look at the meaning anymore. And a lot of that wisdom is not necessarily stuff that's worthwhile after 300,000 years. A lot of it has become merely conventional. 
Um, we can learn a lot from the experience of others, and we should, and I'm going to be sharing some experiences of mine, things I've thought about a lot. Um, but we really need to come up with our own way of thinking of things if we're going to do things uh, in a way that allows each of us to live a life we think is awesome, way worth living. We definitely need some new wisdom. A lot of that wisdom is really cool, but a lot of the, the wisdom from before has brought us to some really serious problems. Um, oh yeah, and as I go along, I'm going to be talking about stuff that I've thought about a lot. That doesn't mean I'm right. And it doesn't mean you have to agree with me either, but hopefully it'll allow you to think about some things, maybe in new ways that will be helpful for you. Um, and I'll try to do it in a nice way. So, but uh, many of the, 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 what we call conventional wisdom has brought us to some serious problems that are facing us now that we need to solve quickly. The planet may no longer be able to support mammals and other creatures within five years, a lot of people are saying. With, along with that, there's more and more disease. We're totally messing up the uh, air and water on our planet. There's way less lack of, uh, of good drinking water, which a lot of people need to live. Uh, there's, soon, there's going to be 98% of, uh, of the wealth owned by 0.1% of the population if things keep going this way, and it seems like they will. There's less and less jobs, which means people don't have money for food and shelter. This makes people hungry and angry, and that leads to very, very, very unstable social situations. And with nuclear threat over us, a war is not exactly what any of us really want to see. We definitely need new wisdom in order to bring us forward into any future at all, let alone a good future, which I really, really would like to see for all of us. Technology is, this is what we usually think of when we think of technology, but it's just tools, you know? It's like, we started off with simple technology way long ago, and we, with that technology, we learn a lot, and we share it, and we, we can make more complex technology, and based on that technology, we know so much more, we can even make more techn uh, technology that's even more uh, complex and more powerful as time goes on. It goes up exponentially. The technology we're able to do now is just amazing and just this badge that we have now and like someone like me who hasn't done FPGAs uh, since 1997 can actually come in and do something really cool in a two-hour workshop. Pretty amazing and um, so I'm going to be asking some questions throughout my uh, talk, just things to ponder about. Uh, my first question uh, is does technology change the world? The questions I'm asking don't have right and wrong answers, but this one actually does. Uh, of course technology changes the world. Everything we do changes the world. For good, for bad, powerful ways, little ways. Um, technology changes the world in many, many ways. Some really cool, some not so cool. We can use technology to make music. That might be good or bad, depending on your point of view. But it can also make the world an incredibly horrible place by causing so many of these problems that I already showed you about. These are all caused by technology. Here's another question. Can we create new tech to solve all of these problems that the old tech created? Can we? Well, maybe. But the thing is, the new tech is even more powerful, and it needs to be more powerful to, uh, to, to solve these problems that were solved by the old tech that had uh, undesirable effects that we didn't even think of. And so the technology that we'll need to solve those problems are going to uh, create all sorts of interesting artifacts that uh, weren't expected, and we'll need even more powerful technology to solve them. And this goes around and around, and I don't think that ends too well necessarily. Yet we need to try. It's all we got. But we need to do it in certain ways. And to do that, I'm going to show you just some context for this. So way back at the beginning of our species, you know, like 300,000 years ago or so, we weren't big and strong like these critters. We, however, have big brains. We're not really strong, but we get together with big brains. And together, we can support ourselves to survive in a sometimes not, uh, our hostile environment. 
And because we survived, the need for that kind of community to support each other survived with us. And even though we don't feel like we need community just to merely survive, we still have this deep inner need within us, and we still need it to feel good about living our lives. To feel part of something bigger than ourselves is super, super important. That's why we're all here at the Super Conference and many of the other communities we create in our lives. We need community. And we need community, I think, to survive now because I think it's the only way that we're going to be able to come together and support each other to solve these massive problems facing us in this very short amount of time that we have to solve them. But we need community, so we're looking for it on our planet. With, and our planet has very little of this community in our modern world. We're all so busy. We have so many obligations. We have all these pressures facing us, all these stresses. We look for it wherever we can. If a family is doing its best, it can be an incredible community. But for many of us, it's like this, or worse. Places of worship, at their best, can be amazing communities. At their worst, they're incredibly fucking awful. School at their best can be amazing. We can come together and learn so much. Quite often though, it just makes people compete and be alone and isolated, taking a test which is totally meaningless. We try to get it at work. Some places at work seem pretty cool, but some places at work look not so cool. We try to find it on TV, which promises us to show us the world and bring us all together, and yet it's just a whole bunch of individuals being alienated, watching a screen at the same time, being lonely, putting people into a state where we can easily be manipulated to buy shit we don't even want or need. It's fantastic for that. And now we have the internet which is, of course, so much better at manipulating people into buying shit we don't want or need and making people isolated and alienated and making people very easily manipulated into fighting one another over things that don't even matter because we have so much more in common than we have all these minor differences that people are destroying themselves, ourselves over and destroying our democracy and governments of all sorts. All of this happens because... All of these technologies are within a context, a cultural context within which these technologies are released into. And those contexts aren't encouraging us to, to use these technologies in ways that benefit all of us. However, we can create more positive contexts like at hacker conferences, like this one, or like this one in Brazil, where I was at a, uh, giving a talk about a year ago. This is all through hacking. And all of you probably have your own definition of hacking. It probably overlaps mine. But hacking, to me, is a way of looking at things. We see the world is full of resources. Everything is a resource that we can use to improve our projects any way that we want to. These resources are all available. We can use them any way we want to improve our projects. We see what works, what doesn't. We share them with other people. And that's what hacking is all about. And that's what it was called in 1953 in MIT before computers even existed. And this is an incredibly enjoyable process. And it's a way of looking at things, a way of being, and it really, really helps all of us. And this is something we can do so much better in community to create a positive context for doing all sorts of amazing things, some amazing things that we've been seeing here in the Hackaday Prize and just out on that hacking table over there over the last two days. Of course, anything can be hacked. It's not limited to just electronics, although of course we can, and computers, it's a lot of fun. But we can also do art and craft and ourselves, science. Ourselves are living lifelong projects that need improvement. Our communities need improvement. We can hack on our communities. We can keep making them stronger and more supportive. The planet needs improvement for sure and needs to be hacked. And if we don't do it, who is going to? It's up to us to do that. Everything can and should be hacked. And we can do that so much better in community. And when we do that, we can hack tools. We can start from simple things, use simple things in powerful ways. We can do that, and we do this in community. The main thing is coming together in community. And once we're in community, we see what the people want to do, what each member wants to do, and then we can 
create the tools we love, hack them together, do whatever we want to do, all sorts of amazing things with whatever, whether it's tech or fabrication or art or music, food, science, biology, whatever. And then we make cool things. And when we do, we can find meaningful things for each and every one of us that might be meaningful for others that can create a fantastic cultural context to do amazing things. However, the broader cultural context is not necessarily supportive of all of this. The broader cultural context has a whole bunch of things which aren't necessarily supportive of a lot of, of, of much of anything good. Here's one of those things. Have you noticed there's a lot of capitalism around? Capitalism is actually quite absurd if you think about it at all. We have these pieces of paper with numbers in the corner, and nowadays it's really just numbers on a screen. And these numbers on a screen, uh, if it's not big enough, you can't buy food and you can't have shelter. What the hell? So in order to get money, pieces of paper with bigger numbers on a corner or bigger numbers on a screen, people probably think of getting a job. And they don't really know if they're going to like their job. They don't even seem to care if they're going to like their job. But so many people are just struggling to get by. They feel like if they get a job, whether they like it or not, they feel lucky that they have a job. At least they get to eat and have shelter. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, though. For instance, I love my job. I turn TVs off for a living, and I help other people do it too. And me and 12 of my friends have made a living doing this for a long time. It, it, there are other possibilities. But here's another question, and this is an important question. Is technology neutral? People probably have very different points of views on this, and to give you my answer, I'm just going to show you just some examples. Um, so here's a piece of technology. This technology was released into the world by people who wanted to pound nails into probably wood. And it turns out that that's what it's incredibly well suited for in the broader cultural context. So that's almost always what hammers are used for, or banging your thumbnail. Um, it can also be used for bonking someone over the head and killing them. But you know, that's not what it's best used for. So what it is used for mostly is banging nails into wood. Here's another piece of technology. Is that neutral? That was put into a world, sorry? It can do lots of things. This can be used as a hammer to pound nails into wood. But given the cultural context within which what it was released, what it's best suited for is killing. And that's what it's almost always used for, especially in our country. And as I travel the world, which I do a lot, I am often asked by people, what the fuck's going on in your country? Um, but anyways, here's another piece of technology. And another. All my life, my adult life, like I said earlier, I've worked in small companies helping them with um, their problems. And these are just a very few of the companies I've, I've helped with their problems, their computer problems, usually microcontrollers. And um, I'm really good at that. And these have been really, really, really fun places to work for. But every single one of these, in every place I've ever worked, without exception, the military has come in and wanted to take our creative output and use it for killing, for destroying, for spying. And every time I quit. The first job I ever had was making computer games on an Apple II computer. This was in 1978 in Urbana, Illinois, and the military came in and said, hey, nice game you got there. How about a little, just a little bit of tweak and custom this, and then we can make killer helicopter training simulators. And the bosses wanted to make money, so they said yes, and I didn't want to put my time and energy into it, so I quit. 
A couple of years later, I'm working at a museum exhibit company. We made lots of really cool exhibits, including the Holocaust Museum exhibit that's now at the Smithsonian. And you press buttons and there's computers, lots of cool stuff. We had to make our own graphics generator, which I worked on because there were no graphics cards back then. And the military came in and said, nice graphics generator you got there. That would be great for marketing our weapon systems to Congress. And the bosses said yes, and I didn't want to put my time and energy and creativity into that, so I quit. At the place where we developed virtual reality called VPL in 87 in uh, Silly Valley, um, uh, we all agreed we would never, ever, ever sell to the military. But the military bought one through the University of Central Florida, which we did sell to, and they used it for World War III training simulator, and I helped. And I couldn't put my energy into it anymore. At the company I started, Threeware, um, the NSA came along and wanted to use our storage uh, cards for storing information. The VCs that took over hired someone specifically to sell to them. We didn't know exactly what they would use it for, but we could guess. And now, since Snowden, we know exactly what they're using it for. Anyways, I quit doing that, too. And then in 2004, I started doing TV Be Gone, and it turns out there's no military application for turning TVs off in public places. for which I'm glad for. But I'm the boss, you know, so, and none of the people, all of our friends, none of us want to do it, so if the military did want to buy stuff from us, no matter how much money we'd make, I would politely tell them to fuck off. So, um, all of this is happening because of a cultural context. We really need to create some better cultural context to put stuff into the world so we can actually help us and those around us. But, you know, cultural context is super important. You know, like toilets can be used for all sorts of things, but in a cultural context for which they're released into, what it's best used for is pissing and pooping. TVs can be used for bookshelves, at least the old kind can. Um, they can also be used for static information, like at a train station or an airport, but what they're best suited for within the cultural context within the, which they exist is manipulating people through sight and sound, which are our most powerful um, uh, senses, and manipulating us into buying shit we don't want or need, anything from dish soap to political candidates. Social, so-called social media, can be used for all sorts of things to, they promise bringing us together. It can be used for joy and warm and fuzziness but it's best suited for within the cultural context of creating from the very beginning, as of course they purposely have done, to make an addictive platform, and the best addictive things are outrage and anger and fear and hatred, and manipulating people all the better into buying shit they don't want or need, from dish soap to political candidates. Part of this cultural context is the military, and in particular, the U.S. military, one of the biggest single, the biggest single aspect of the U.S. economy is the military, which is also the single by far biggest polluter of our planet. And it's also concentrating much, much, much more wealth in the very, very few tiny people at the very, very top. And they're using that to do weapon systems which destroy and kill and spy. The US uh, military is more than six times the rest of the world's military put together. It's euphemistically called Department of Defense. It's not about defense, it's about making the maximum profit that they possibly can regardless of other consequences. And this affects so many different things, including things as wonderful as Maker Faire, which I poured my heart and soul into for the first five years from 2006 to 2011, starting with just a few soldering irons and teaching people to solder, and growing really popular so I could teach thousands of people in a weekend how to make cool things with electronics. And this is popular enough now that I don't even have to do a thing and there's tables full of soldering irons out there and it's totally fun. But in 2011, after five years of pouring my heart and soul into it, I was awarded an award named after me, the Mitch Altman Maker Hero Award. And if you wanna see a video of me crying out of joy and happiness, it's still online. And um, this was the first and the last Mitch Haltman 
Maker Hero Award because the day after that I got that award, it was announced publicly for the first time that Maker Fair and Make sought after and received $10 million from the US military to do cool things, a thousand hacker spaces in a thousand high schools. Um, but I couldn't continue to help when I knew it was gonna be helping the military and they were recruiting at maker fairs. They were showing killer robots, cool killer robots at maker fairs. DARPA had a keynote talk at the maker fair. And I knew I'd feel like shit if I quit helping Maker Faire, but I knew I'd feel worse if I continued. So I stopped. But when you stop doing something, it gives time and energy for something else, and I was actually invited to give my first TED Talk, TEDx Brussels, uh, when I ended up giving a talk about hackerspaces, which helped a whole bunch of people create hackerspaces around the world, and it's really gratifying. This one project of mine did pretty well. It was a Kickstarter, a successful Kickstarter. is a sleep mask that works with brain waves to help people sleep. Very strange project. But, um, uh, you know, that, that project, and I still have some left, but it pretty much ended. But these other people came along about a year ago who wanted to put feedback into it to make it more powerful, and I was helping with them uh, for about three months. They're called Sana. And, uh, but then it just, out of nowhere, they said, oh, um, uh, I just found out that through ch just talking with them on the phone that they were going to be selling to the U.S. Navy. Because they're saying, you know, you look on their website, it says all about helping people, and they want to help everyone, including people in the U.S. Navy, evidently. So I looked on their website, and, um, and it, it's not just the U.S. Navy, but it's the Air Force, and then the Special Boat Service. What the hell is the special boat service? I looked on Wikipedia and it says that um, it's, uh, you, can't, you can't find out because it's classified, highly classified due to sensitivity of their operations. If it's helping people, I don't think it would need to be highly classified or sensitive. And then, there, of course, there's a special air service. <laughs> and the Royal Marines, and the, all of this was on their website, and you know, like, so I stopped helping them. There's all these places that I, I'm diminishing the number of places that I feel I can put my time and energy to try to make the world a better place and not hurt people with my creative output. And one of the biggest things is corporations, not all corporations, but publicly traded corporations exist for profit, of course, they're for profit. But not only profit, there's nothing wrong with profit in and of itself, but maximizing profit every quarter is what they're doing. Because if they don't, the board gets fired and the CEO gets fired and they don't want to get fired, so they're going to do whatever they can in order to maximize profit every quarter. If, it, if, they, if it's more profitable to pollute rather than do what's right, then the corporation's going to pollute. If it's more profitable to make a car that explodes when it gets rear-ended rather than do the right thing, then the corporation is going to do that as Ford Pintos did rather than because it was cheaper to pay uh, insurance for the dead people's family. If it's more profitable to make food, or so-called food, uh, for which the long-term effects aren't known, they're going to do it if it's more profitable. If it's more profitable to make systems, like weapon systems, to kill, destroy, and spy, then corporations are going to do that because there exists to do so. If it's more profitable to pay for candidates that will then in turn give you laws to make more profit, they'll do so. The U.S. military is on the top of that food chain. The U.S. Supreme Court, after determining that corporations have all of the rights but none of the responsibility of human beings, plus the ability to have unlimited campaign contributions, of course they pay for politicians who will then in turn, in turn give them laws that maximize their profit, and that's an amazing return on investment. So what do we do in the face of all of this? Well, first of all, we've got to think about what our ethics are. And we've got to put a lot of thought into that. And there's no right and wrong with any of this. Well, there's shades of gray to dark gray. Um, but each of us has to come up with our own ways of doing that. And of course, we can do that so much better in a supportive community. 
But, you know, it's tempting to accept money. And governments around the world are giving money, and some of it's really good. Some of it might not be. I think it's really, really important to be thinking about the source. There's always strings attached, always, no matter what. If the coolest person that you think is the coolest person in the world gives you money, there's still strings attached. But if a government agency does, of course, there's explicit ones and also implicit ones. So if, if the source of money aligns with your values, great. There's a lot of good chance you're going to be doing the world a good turn by accepting the money. But if you don't agree with the values of the organization or people who are giving the money, you are definitely making the world a worse place by enhancing the values you do not agree with. Here's another question, it's really what I just said. Where do you draw the line? The world isn't perfect, it's messy. There's no way to be perfect, but we have to draw the line somewhere and let's keep evaluating each of us, evaluating where we're unwilling to cross and where we are and keep, a, keep changing that so we keep getting better. For myself, I'm an American citizen. It's illegal to not pay taxes. There's some ways of doing it, but I pay taxes. I pay what's legally, I'm legally required, but not a penny more. And I know for myself, I will never, I never have and I never will knowingly help the military directly or indirectly. That's me. And I want to talk about startups. Oop. So I got to end this quickly. Startups, you've probably noticed, are almost incredibly stupid. They are incredibly stupid because they only are there about money. They start with money and they end with money. And so it drives people to do the incredibly stupid things. IoT can be incredibly cool, but um, this is going out just to make money, and so all these incredibly stupid things are in, uh, going out into the world, and in our cultural context, it's not a good thing. This is a spying nightmare. And we're, we seem to be into it as a class uh, of consumers because people are putting things into their homes or apartments that listen to them and spy on them 24 hours a day of everything they're doing. And these things are, have security. If they're a thought at all, it comes way after. And so they can be hijacked, as this was done in 2016, to bring down huge parts of the internet, Amazon, Reddit, Twitter, uh, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera, because there was a hard-coded um, hard password <laughs> in the hardware. And is this the kind of stuff we want in our bodies? And here's a guy who wants us all to put implants in our brains. I don't see him going out to put an implant in his brain. He wants to make money on us putting implants in our brain. In our cultural context of all this stuff, this definitely doesn't end well. And for corporations wanting to play off people's fear of death and wanting to live forever, people into all this stuff wanting to upload their brain into a computer, these startups start. And in fact, it's actually 100% fatal, the opposite of immortality. We can do something better. I think we can do way better than all of that. You know, if we're going to be entrepreneurial, you know, we can get together in community and do amazing things as we've been doing here. And if we're going to be entrepreneurial, and, and I like to encourage that. You don't have to, but if you want to be entrepreneurial, don't start with this. A good entrepreneurial person starts with meaning, finding meaning, and then sharing that meaning through whatever it is you're selling because people are willing to buy something they feel is meaningful. If you're going to do anything entrepreneurial, you've got to do it this way. You explore. You can do that better in community that supports you in doing that. Explore. See what works. Try some things. Fail. Learn from failing. We learn from failing much more than our successes because we fail more often. It's not always fun, but we learn a lot. And then you try again, and you keep trying, and it goes up and down. It's a roller coaster. We keep trying. Eventually, we find a project we think is really awesome. Maybe it's meaningful. Maybe the people in our community think it's meaningful. Maybe in the people in the broader community find it's meaningful. And now you have something that people will pay you to do because they'll pay you to do something they feel is meaningful and now you have a startup that actually has some possibility of success that will actually help you and the people around you and maybe even our planet and the thing is it doesn't need to grow 
We can't continue to grow our economy on a finite, on a finite planet. We don't need another Google and another Apple. Growing is fine if it grows organically, it's totally fine, but growing isn't always a good thing. TV Be Gone is me and 12 people that have had a small, sustainable business for 12 years and we've made a living from it. What if you had a company or worked for someone else's company where you felt strongly that it was wonderful and you could make a living from it along with everyone else? What would your life be like? What if everyone in this room worked for a company like that? I think this is a, a unique situation because there's so many more people here doing that than any other place, but still not everyone here is doing that. I would love to see everyone here doing that and everyone on our planet, ideally. What would the world be like if people were doing that? We can share what we do with everyone, old and young. We can do this and do meaningful things, explore and find meaningful things and share them around. We can, by doing this, we can solve our problems small and huge. Just one last question before I round up. What is success? Since this is one of the things that drives so many people needing to be a success, but what is it? Is it this? That is not success. That's a pile of money. Maybe you can do some cool things with that pile of money, but that in and of itself is not success. It's just a pile of fucking money. What can you do with money? Maybe we can do some cool things, but that is not going to solve the world's problems. But changing how we live our lives and how we live and learn and grow and share that is super powerful. But here's my definition of success, and I've pretty much already said it. But what would your life be like if by doing whatever it is you love doing, you got enough of whatever you need to keep doing it? What more do you need? And we all have that ability. And we all have that ability even much more if we're in a community that supports us all, each individual, to keep doing that. The future is up to us. And us alone, we're creating it all as we're sitting here and going off and doing whatever we're doing next in our lives. It's up to us to do these cool things because if we wait for our leaders to start doing it, we are all going to be fucking dead. But while we're alive is when we have the opportunity to help ourselves and those around us. And if we're doing this in community, it's even more powerful. And if our communities are helping each other Wherever it makes sense, who knows what the world will be like very soon. Thanks.